Welcome to the sixth and final segment of this course. Uh, before we start, well, of course, first of all, let's start with the prayers we have with the, every class and as we do here. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Before uh, getting into this uh, material, I want to uh, make a suggestion. Uh, if you have any questions on any of these things that we've covered, we've uh, had to compress an awful lot. And... Uh, some of it may be uh, unclear or whatever. Uh, please let me know. Uh, the uh, uh, material is covered in the 50 Questions on the Natural Law book, which I wrote uh, that's published by Ignatius Press. But you may have further questions on some of these things that may come up. And please do not hesitate to uh, let me know. Uh, the, uh, the address is just uh, Notre Dame Law School. Notre Dame Law School is just Notre Dame, Indiana. The zip code is 46556. And the phone number, 219-631-5667. And the fax is 219 Four one nine seven, and there's email there, but I haven't figured it out yet. So, uh, uh, if you never want me to hear what you're saying, send it by email. But uh, please don't hesitate. If there's any further information you want, any material you want, and any of these things, any references, uh, please let me know. Or if you just have questions on the uh, on the topic. Uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, really interesting stuff, and it's something that uh, uh, you ought to uh, uh, maintain it. We all ought to maintain a continuing interest uh, in. Uh, basically, what uh, we are talking about is the natural law as a, a guide for personal conduct and also as a guide for a limited government. Uh, especially in its ability to uh, evaluate human laws and to say that there's a limit to what the state can do, that the, the law, human law, can be unjust and therefore void. Now, way at the beginning of this whole thing, we started off by uh, looking at the pre basic premises of the Enlightenment, which uh, dominate our culture and our law. And those uh, premises are secularism, uh, yeah, secularism, relativism, and individualism. The secularism, the idea that uh, we try to organize society and the law as if God doesn't exist. Relativism, the notion that nobody can know what's right or wrong. Of course, relativism is absurd. The statement that nothing is certain is absurd because you are affirming as certain the statement that nothing is certain. Or if you say that the only things you can know are the things you can prove by experiment, the things that you can prove empirically, that's absurd because you can't prove that statement empirically. So you can know things. And that's really the basis of a lot of what we've done in this course. Then individualism uh, is the notion that we're all autonomous, isolated individuals uh, with no relation to others. And what I'd like to do at the start, no intrinsic relation to others, what I'd like to do at the start is spell out the ways that John Paul II has responded to this. This is where the natural law of St. Thomas becomes incorporated into the teaching of Christ. Uh, John Paul is not a professor of natural law. He is not simply teaching natural law. 
What John Paul is doing is uh, teaching Christ. And uh, in this uh, teaching, he has directly confronted this enlight these Enlightenment premises. And it's, uh, it's interesting what he's been doing. In the Veritatis Splendor, John Paul talked about the dichotomy between freedom and truth. And what did he mean by that? He was talking there about the prevailing idea that our conscience has no duty toward an objective truth. That our conscience is simply our decision as to whatever we want to do. And our conscience uh, cannot be judged by whether it uh, conforms to the truth. And what, uh, what John Paul did in Veritatis Splendor was to uh, point out uh, how this leads to chaos. And this uh, leads to a dehumanized situation. Interestingly, uh, uh, Reverend Harvey Chin, who was a Protestant minister in California, wrote uh, shortly after Veritatis, he said, uh, the world can really profit from this great document. He said, I am a better Protestant for having read it. I've been a minister for 50 years. I am a better Protestant for having read it. Why? Because he gets back to the basic uh, things that are common to all of us, really, and then carries it on into the teaching of Christ. And in response to the secularism of the Enlightenment, John Paul tells us that the dichotomy between freedom and truth is a result of a more basic dichotomy between morality and faith. Now, that's kind of interesting. See, up there on the top blackboard, I've got the, the line drawn between the natural law and the divine law. Uh, the, the modern culture operates below that line, even if they talk about a natural law. It's a natural law without God. And John Paul is saying that that's not good enough. Our philosophy uh, uh, professors and academics have been debating these questions, you know, natural law and so on, uh, uh, particularly in this century. <clears throat> and in recent decades, the, uh, the one thing you can't bring into those discussions, or the one thing that uh, you find it very difficult to bring in, is any affirmation of the law of God as really dispositive. And what John Paul is saying is that uh, that game is over. That morality, natural law morality, is, to is accessible to reason. Yes. But natural law morality ultimately requires a lawgiver and makes ultimate sense, complete sense, only in the context of that lawgiver. Now, please don't misunderstand. Natural law is a law relating to, to nature, to our nature, and it's a rule that uh, it's built into our nature that we can know from reason. But as St. Thomas said in the very first question in the entire Summa, uh, philosophy is not enough. And we need to go above that line. We need, uh, if we really want to be complete, we need to go above that line and to listen to what God is telling us. So that's John Paul's response to the secularism of the Enlightenment, saying, no, that's not good enough. It doesn't work. And in response to the relativism of the Enlightenment, John Paul says, hey, there is an objective norm. There is an objective norm of conduct. Some things are right and wrong. There is an objective standard. But that standard is not an abstraction. It's not some idea of the rational animal or whatever. All that is academic, abstract, kind of boring in a sense. He says, no. He says the objective norm is a person. The objective norm of morality is Christ. 
That's the objective norm. He is the objective norm. It's Christ who tells us what it means to be human. And in response to the individualism of the Enlightenment, John Paul, you know, the individualism of the Enlightenment uh, coming out of the social compact idea that uh, in the state of nature we were all these isolated, autonomous individuals, and then we got together and by our consent we formed the state. And the nature of the individual is that he has no relation to others except as he consents. And John Paul says, no. He says, no. He says, Christ, <clears throat> the objective norm, shows us that the person, the human person, is fulfilled only through the gift of self. Person as gift, right? The person as relation. What does he mean by that? What, what are we talking about there? We're talking about creation. This is where it really gets interesting. You know, we mentioned before uh, the, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And St. Thomas uh, said that when he was discussing the Trinity, that the persons of the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, are pure relations. They are relations among themselves. You cannot think of one except in relation to the other. They are relation. He said he did not apply that to the human person. To the human person, he replied, he applied the classical definition of Boethius, which is that the person is a an individual of rational nature, an individual with intellect and will. The divine persons, he said, are different. Divine persons are relations, intrinsically. Now, in the Second Vatican Council, in the pastoral constitution on the church, Gaudium et Spes, in Numbers 22 and 24, opened this issue. And it said that Christ shows us that there is a certain parallel between the persons of the Trinity and the human person. And John Paul has said that the human person is relational. This has been a theme throughout much of what has gone on since the Second Vatican Council. And what John Paul is telling us uh, is that Christ, the crucified Christ, shows us that the human person really achieves fulfillment and truly is a person, truly acts as a person, only through the free gift of self to God and neighbor. That's the idea of the person as gift, person as relation. That's why in, in even, this is great stuff. The other stuff, the, the other, Philosophical stuff is, is, is it's all true and, and all that, but it's kind of boring. All right, but this is great stuff. That's why in, in Evangelium Vitae, when he was discussing uh, Cain and Abel, and Cain asked God, to say, when God said uh, to Cain, where's Abel? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And John Paul's answer explicitly in Evangelium Vitae is yes. We are our brother's keeper. And this is uh, really, you say, what has this got to do with jurisprudence? And natural law has got everything to do with it. Because, as John Paul is telling us, the nature of the human person is the foundation of society, the dignity of the human person. The, fa the basic foundation of society, of the human law and of human society, is the dignity of the person. The dignity of the person. And from what does the person derive that dignity? He derives it because he is made in the image and likeness of God. Put it over here. The dignity of the person. 
from that dignity, or that, that dignity means that the, that the human person is made in the image and likeness of God, that he has a transcendent destiny, that his destiny is to spend eternity <coughs> sharing the life of the Trinity. And from that dignity of the person follow the two principles on which human society should be organized. Now those two principles are solidarity and subsidiarity. Those are the two principles on which you organize society. When John Paul talked to the uh, Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences uh, in April 97, he was talking about the world trade market and the, the international global economy and all that. And he said, the important thing is that this has to uh, be carried out with obedience to the concepts of, with deference and, and respect for the concepts of solidarity and subsidiarity. What does that mean? Solidarity means that uh, uh, we do have relation to others. It means that uh, we are uh, uh, responsible for others. That we, we cannot uh, be treated as simply isolated or autonomous individuals. Subsidiarity means that, or is, is a basic principle that social tasks should be performed by individuals, by families, and only if necessary by uh, government, and then by the lowest possible level of government. And how do these things follow? Well, uh, solidarity, meaning that we are responsible for others. We, we don't have a right, you know, the uh, employer doesn't have a right to make economic decisions without regard to the welfare of the employee, and vice versa, because we are in solidarity. You don't have the right to treat somebody as a mere economic unit without regard to his welfare as a person. Because we are in solidarity. But why are we in solidarity? Because we are made in the image of God. And the image of God is relational. In that the persons are, of the Trinity are relations, and we are relations to one another. And we have no right. This is, it gets into economics. We have no right, for example, in the economic sphere to apply uh, you know, exaggerated free market ideas in such a way that we do so without regard to the welfare of others. At the same time, uh, John Paul has criticized as strongly collectivism and socialism. We have an obligation to others. Why? Because we are made in the image and likeness of the Trinity, of the persons of the Trinity. We are relational. Subsidiarity, what does that mean? Well, it means that it, it means that the human person has a destiny that transcends the state. And he cannot be fulfilled by the state. That's why the state is not everything. That's why the state exists for the person. The person does not exist for the state. Now, there's no way that human positive, that legal positivism uh, or utilitarianism can make that judgment and make it coherently. The human person has a destiny that transcends the state because that human person himself is immortal. And that's why. The state should not try to do everything. You know, when, when the uh, French Revolution took power, the very first act of the legislature was, what do you think? What do you think was the very first act of the French Revolutionary Legislature? It was to abolish corporations. You say, why? What's that got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. Rousseau, for example, said that between the state 
and the individual, there should be nothing. And his essay on the government of Poland, he said, uh, when the child opens his eyes, he should see not the face of his father, but the sta face of the state. This is the idea of the autonomous, isolated individual. The isolated individual, all by himself, against the state, with nothing above the state, with no law higher than the state. That's why Rousseau said that if the state says you must die, you must die. Because the general will is what controls, and the general will is not the will of the majority or the will of the, or the, will of the people. The general will is the will of the sovereign. As John Paul has said on various occasions, the result of enlightenment theory, secularism, relativism, individualism, is, that, is exactly this, that uh, what you end up with is the individual, uh, a collection of isolated individuals, each one his own God. against the power of the state. John Paul is saying in, in subsidiarity, subsidiarity is something that, that grows out of the very nature of the person, the dignity of the person, because the person is made in the image and likeness of God. And he has a destiny that transcends the state. What John Paul is saying is that in between the state and the individual, there must be all kinds of intermediate groupings. The most important being the family. Associations, unions, corporations, fraternal groups, local governments. One of the worst developments in American constitutional law, in Supreme Court decisions, in the past 20 or so years, has been the obliteration of 40 or so years has been the obliteration of local government. The taking of decisions out of the hands of local government. Even on simple questions like should a kid be allowed to read an address at a school commencement which mentions God, this has to be decided by the federal courts. It's all taken out of the hands of the, the people at the local level. That's not what John Paul is talking about. He's saying the state is not everything. And this natural law that limits the power of the state is a natural law that says that the family is the basic unit of society. The family is the basic cell of society. The family uh, comes before the state. Aristotle affirmed the importance of the family, but he, he put the family subordinate to the state because he said the whole is greater than the parts. Not so with the natural law as expounded by Thomas and as incorporated into the teaching of Christ by John Paul. That's important. The family uh, question, you know, the first question you got to ask is, what is the family? Right? A few years ago, during the Carter administration, they had a, uh, a White House conference on the family. And the whole thing broke up. You know why? Because they couldn't, they didn't break up, but they, it descended into chaos because they couldn't define what the family was. So they renamed it. They said the White House Conference on Families. Now what is a family? Is a family just a grouping? Or is there something in nature? Something in the nature of things that defines the family? And I would suggest that uh, 
If you know anybody who is uh, contemplating marriage, or if you're married and you haven't read it yet, uh, recommend to that person or read yourself or both John Paul's Letter to Families, 1994, which incorporates these basic and, and great natural law principles into the discussion of the family. The family, the family is not just a collection of isolated individuals. It's not, uh, uh, it, it, for example, uh, Justice Brennan, William Brennan in, on the Supreme Court, in Eisenstadt against Baird in 1972. That was the case where the court held unconstitutional a Massachusetts law that forbade the distribution of contraceptives, not the use, but the distribution of contraceptives. And Justice Brennan struck it down because he said the right of privacy includes the right to decide whether to bear or beget a child. He was signaling the abortion decision which came down the following year. But he also said this, he said, marriage is an association of two individuals. Now when we're talking natural law, we're talking about the natural law as we find it incorporated into the teaching of Christ by John Paul. This becomes a very important point. What is the family? And what is marriage? Brennan and American law will tell you that today that the, the, that the family, that marriage is simply an association of two individuals. What does that mean? Well, listen, if you and I make a deal, we make a contract so that I'm going to cut your lawn every week, the law will not make us stay in that contract, especially if we both want to get out of it, or if one of us wants to get out of it. The law will not make us stay in it. <clears throat> so if marriage is nothing but an association, but a purely a, a contract between two individuals, the logic of that is no fault divorce. Just as the logic of the contraceptive ethic is no fault divorce. Because if sex has no inherent relation to procreation, why should sex be reserved for marriage in the first place, and why should marriage be permanent? John Paul, now what, he's, what, what John Paul is doing is taking St. Thomas on the family and incorporating it into the teaching of Christ. And in the letter to families in 1994, John Paul says, hey, marriage is a covenant. All right, it's a covenant. And it's a covenant which of its nature is total. It has to be total. It's a total self-donation. It's total and it's permanent. Why? Because it's Im in imitation of the Trinity. It all relates back here. It's an imitation of the Trinity. The family is an imitation of the Trinity. And the just as the Existence and the relation of the persons in the Trinity is one of total self-donation, total relation. So it is in the family. And it's total self-donation. No holding back. That's why it's permanent. And total. And it results in communion. The communion of the spouses. Communion of the spouses. Again, total self-donation. That's why uh, contraception is so contrary to this. Because it's a withholding of self. And then this results in the community of the family with the child. That's a great thing. That's a great stuff. And the whole idea here is the family is more than just a collection of isolated individuals make a contract. John Locke 
who was uh, a social contract theorist, said the family exists solely for the purpose of begetting children, and once the children are raised and on their own, the obligation ceases. What a narrow-minded, what a def negative defeatist view of nature. On the contrary, what John Paul does, uh, incorporating Thomas and incorporating the tradition into this whole thing, is give us a view of the family where the family does not exist for the state. But the state exists to promote the common good, which includes the welfare of the family and includes the welfare of the person. That's why John Paul, for example, on the economic side, emphasizes the family wage. Right? And it's just, it, it, the church does not offer specific prescriptions in the economic realm. They don't offer a, a contract with America or anything like that. God help us. They offer a offer principles. And one of the things that, that uh, the church, I mean, this has been going on with numerous popes this century. One of the things that the church is emphasized and continues to emphasize is the family wage. That is that uh, justice requires justice. And, I, and you can know justice because justice is not an irrational ideal as Hans Kelsen would say. The justice requires a, that, that the family wage be such that one person could support the family on his, on his earnings. John Paul emphasizes the right of women to work, to be free to work, etc. But this says they should not be forced out of the home. And the obligation of society and of the state is to try to structure the economic system and the uh, in the in terms of the common good, so as to promote a family wage. How do you do it? Well, they've made several unsuccessful attempts to do it in the 20s, in the 1920s, uh, by fiat, by legislation. One way you could do it is by the tax code. If the $600 personal tax exemption, which was instituted in 1948 in the Internal Revenue Code that year, had kept up with inflation, it would be in excess of $9,000 today per person. And that is a, uh, in effect, a family wage, in a sense. And John Paul has criticized very strongly the uh, economic development uh, developments uh, in recent years, which have forced women out of the home and have made it impossible for families to exist on one income. This is common sense. It's also based on the, the nature of the family. The family is not, is not a collection of drones. It's not a collection of uh, uh, economic units to be uh, subjected to the service of uh, corporations. And the family is uh, uh, something that the state is required uh, to promote. And this is, uh, uh, again, simply an application of what Thomas is saying about the natural law. And in, in basic terms, uh, the natural law that we've been studying here, we've been talking about, is, as its definition tells you, a rule of reason. It's a rule of reason promulgated in man by which he can know how he should act. And it's also a rule of reason which operates as a limit on the power of the state. 
And when we started this whole thing off, we started it out with the uh, discussion of the prevailing culture of the Enlightenment, the secularism, the relativism, the individualism, and so on. And it uh, really is important to, uh, to see where that has brought us and to see how it is true that the only real response to that is the response of the natural law. That there is a, a higher law, there's a, a dignity here. And when we talk about legalized abortion, we talk about the person, the dignity of the person. Well, in legalized abortion, what we're doing is legally depersonalizing human beings. And only a natural law approach can, can say, hey, that cannot be done. It's contrary to the nature of the person, contrary to the law of God. And essentially, uh, our issue today, now the issue that we have to decide is, is this. Who is God? That's the issue. I mean, is it the real God, or is it the state? Or is it all of us? That's really the issue. And it has come to uh, uh, a head in the last 30 or so years, 40 years, because of technology, because of uh, our newfound ability to uh, control. Uh, in genetic engineering and uh, the potential for genetic engineering, cloning and all the rest of that, and in uh, reproductive uh, limitations, contraception, abortion, and so on. And we have uh, uh, here a confrontation uh, that really is uh, answerable only in terms of nature and in terms of uh, the natural law and the author of that law. John Paul, for example, uh, in Evangelium Vitae, said this. He said, we are facing an enormous and dramatic clash between good and evil, death and life, the culture of death and the culture of life. We find ourselves not only faced with, but necessarily in the middle of this conflict. We are all involved and we all share in it with the responsibility of choosing to be unconditionally pro-life. And in that encyclical, as I mentioned before, he affirmed the absolute prohibition of the intentional killing of the innocent and of abortion and of euthanasia. And interestingly, John Paul uh, affirmed in Evangelium Vitae that abortion and contraception come from the same root. And we should come out of the bomb shelters on that issue. Because so many in the pro-life movement and so many in the church try to avoid that contraception issue, as if it uh, uh, really is not essential. And we should go back and, and keep that in mind. It's a, it, the encyclical by Paul VI, Humanae Vitae, was based on natural law. It was, a, it was a teaching of natural law. It wasn't simply a natural law exposition, but he used natural law argumentation. It, it, its authority didn't depend on the arguments, but what Paul VI, and it's worth reviewing and re-emphasizing, emphasized was the separation of the unitive and the procreative aspects of sex. And that's important. I mean, that, it, what's, what's happened is that Mankind, has, for the first time in history, now has the ability to do that, to separate the unitive and procreative aspects of sex. So that in contraception, you 
uh, you seek the unitive while frustrating the uh, you, you, know, you seek the unitive while frustrating the procreational in in vitro fertilization. You seek the procreative while rejecting the unitive. And what a difference there is between what Paul the Sixth is saying and John Paul is saying about this total commitment, this total self-donation and contraceptive ethic. Because as John Paul has pointed out in Familiaris Consortio in 1981, through the contraceptive practice, man makes himself the arbiter of when life begins. And just as in vitro fertilization is the attempt to seize the procreator without the unitive, and so is cloning. So if man makes himself the arbiter of when life begins, there's no question he's going to make himself the arbiter of when it ends, as in abortion and euthanasia. We've gone through all this before. It's worth mentioning again. And where the conjugal act where marriage should be total self-donation, total communion. All right? John Paul has pointed out that in the contraceptive act, it's a total frustration of communication. Through drugs or plugs, you say, well, I won't accept you, and I won't totally give myself. And all these things that we, everybody gets all bent out of shape about have followed from this kind of thing. The uh, you know, the old problem of promiscuity, divorce. Thomas argued, St. Thomas argued that marriage should be permanent because, among other things, of the, of the children. And if, if sex has no inherent relation to procreation, then why should marriage, why should sex be reserved for marriage and why should marriage be permanent? And what about pornography? What's wrong with that? Pornography is the ultimate objectification of women. And this is, uh, is important to keep in mind because these are ingredients of what John Paul has called the culture of death. Let me get, just give you an illustration. You know, give you an idea of how uh, uh, how basic this uh, this issue is. Uh, you know, man is made of, uh, both sexes of course, made of body and soul, spiritual soul. And the only creating that God has done since the very first creation, the only creating God has done has been the creation of each individual human soul. That's right. When you put uh, two puppies, uh, two dogs together, they mate, and the material forces operate, and you get a litter of puppies. But the human soul, which is spiritual, cannot come out of material things. Each human soul is the product of a separate, willed act of creation by God. And since there is no time in eternity, that, that soul has been willed from all eternity. That's right. And I'm speaking uh, to you here from Notre Dame, South Bend, or just north of South Bend. And down here in St. Joe Hospital or Memorial Hospital tonight, Probably some little kid will be born. And about nine months ago, that kid's life began. And if you think about it, there's going to come a time when this law school building will not be here. There won't be a a New York, or a Washington, or a Paris, or Rome. There won't even be a Notre Dame Stadium. I mean, it'll all be gone. There'll come a time when all of this will be gone. And that little kid will still be alive. 
That's the basis for his transcendent right against the state. That's the basis for saying the state dare not declare him a non-person. And when you think about it, that little kid will still be alive when all of this is gone. And then you, you think, what about the contracepting couple? What does the contracepting couple say to God? What they say to God is this. They say, for all we know, it may be your will that through this act of ours, a new person will be created who will live forever. For all we know, that may be your will, and we won't let you do it. That's awesome. And that's why that's such a defining issue. That's why, when you look back at, as I showed to you before, William Bennett's analysis of how things have collapsed from the 1960 through the present day, what happened in the 60s, early 60s? One thing that happened was that the state, the United States, declared itself neutral as to God. And the other thing happened that happened was the legalization of the pill. Man liberated himself from God and became God. And all hell has broken loose with a capital H. That's the reason why these issues are so important. And that's why we're in the middle of a culture of death. That's why. And that's why the only response to that culture of death is the response based on the nature of the human person, based on the natural law, but also based on the natural law as it comes from the lawgiver. When I mean, you look at all this, you, you look at uh, the developments and so on, uh, you can say, well, boy, this is really, we're really in a bad way. We're not. This is a great time to be here. I think it's a great time to be here. I think our grandchildren are going to live in a golden age of the church. John Paul, remember what John Paul has done, uh, has incorporated St. Thomas into the teaching of Christ. He has so frequently and strongly recommended St. Thomas, but he's sublimated that, and he's, he's incorporated it into the teaching of Christ, and the moral norm is Christ. This is a great time to be here. And John Paul has said that we're on the threshold of a springtime of Christianity. I believe it. I think the attitude that we have to have is the attitude of the early Christians. St. John Chrysostom uh, described them in these words. It's interesting. He said, and I quote, they ignored the danger of death. They forgot how few they were. They never noticed how many were against them, or the power or strength or wisdom of their enemies. Their power was greater than all of that. Theirs was the power of him who had died on the cross and risen again, unquote. And we're in a uh, position where uh, we're on the winning side. And it's a great time to be here because there's so many signs that this renewal, this authentic renewal is, is, has already begun. Father Joseph Fessio of uh, Ignatius Press 
gave a talk a while ago that made a great impression on me. He recounted the reaction of, of St. Benedict to the Roman culture. And he said, St. Benedict went to Subiaco. He, he, he left. He just said, in effect, he, he said, to hell with it. He didn't try to reform the culture. He went and, and went off to live for Christ, to live and to be for Christ. And he didn't try to, he didn't get into political activity or any of that. And others came and joined him. And more and more. And that was the beginning of the monastic movement. And by the year 1100, there were so many monasteries, there was an incredible number of monasteries throughout Europe. And without trying to, they, they did create a new culture. And that's what we're doing. That's what we have to do. We don't set out to do that. We, what we have to do is to live for Christ. And Father Fessio said that the monasteries of our day are the families. They're the home schools. They're the authentic religious schools. They're the private initiatives, but especially the families. These are the monasteries uh, of today. And I think the uh, importance of that for us is that uh, we recognize that this is not simply a human thing. We, we are uh, dealing here with natural law, but we're dealing here with the lawgiver of that natural law. And the lawgiver is, is somebody who has shown us what it means to be human, somebody who has uh, died on the cross for us. And what do we do? How do we do it? Well, let me uh, tell you about a little, about a uh, comment uh, that uh, Cardinal Gagnon made when he was head of the Pontifical Council for the Family. I can read it to you. Let me just tell you about it. He had a conversation with Pope John Paul II. And he said, the Pope complimented me on my work with the council. And then he said this, and it, it, from here on, the Cardinal is quoting John Paul. He said, the Pope said to me, and this is, in effect, this is virtually a quote. The Pope said to me, error makes its way because the truth is not taught. He said, we must not spend all our time refuting the errors of those who are wrong. There are so many that that would never end. He said, instead, we must speak the truth. He said, speak the truth. Teach the truth. He said, because when you teach the truth, a grace goes with it. And nothing much may happen right away, but Later on, when that person needs that grace, that grace will be there and it will operate. When you don't speak the truth, no grace goes with it. Error, he said, and he's still quoting the Pope, said, error may have all the material resources, but it does not have the grace accompanying it. So teach the truth. And that's what we have to do. We have to speak the truth. Speak the truth about nature. Speak the truth about God. About the nature of the person. About the human person and the nature of the state. And we have to pray. We have to pray especially uh, through Mary. Mary is uh, the mother of God, the mother of life. And this issue relates so much to life to the issues of life. Pray through Mary. Pray especially the rosary. The rosary of the Battle of Lepanto sank ships. The rosary can sink ships. Uh, Mary is, as Father Patrick Payton said, Mary is omnipotent when she prays. So pray, especially through Mary, the Mother of God. And remember that uh, we are persons human persons who are created in the image of God, that God has given us this natural law, given us this natural law to enable us to choose to be with him 
uh, forever. And I think the most important practical thing that we can do uh, for this country today is to, as Cardinal Ganio said, as John Paul said, speak the truth and pray, especially through Mary and through the Rosary. Thank you.